Good morning and welcome to the Sport for Business Daily. It's a great thrill today. We're joined by Kira McGeehan, who potentially could have been uh, running in, in Tokyo at the Olympics this summer. Now the hope is that she will this time next year, but she has come out of the starting blocks or come off the line with a blistering start to uh, post-lockdown athletics. Kira, you're very welcome to Sport for Business. Thank you for having me on. Um, real pleasure. Look, you have absolutely set the sports pages and the sports bulletins alight with your uh, with your two records uh, coming in your first two races back. How did you prepare to come out in such blistering fashion? Um, to be honest, uh, the same as I always prepare. I suppose um, my this this year and this season has been a bit unprecedented and and the same as for everybody we don't really know what to expect and didn't know what to expect when lockdown started I was like ah oh, it's fine it'll be it'll be over soon and, and and it wasn't and it still is 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 trundling on relatively um continuously uh so I suppose whenever it all began myself and my coach had said like this is how it is. We have to just approach it and, and try to make the best of a bad situation. Um, and personally, I, I viewed it as a blessing in disguise. I, I was like, whenever the Olympics was postponed, um, I was like, okay, that gives me another year to close the gap on the girls ahead. I finished 10th in the world final in Doha last year. And as soon as I got off the track, the first thing I said to my coach was, how do I close the gap? Um, and I knew it would take time and it was something that I couldn't just do overnight. Uh, so this year gives me that opportunity and has lent me that opportunity to continue to learn and to continue to, to kind of Im improve the, the athlete that is Kira McGeehan because I know that I'm still not the finished product. So um, we had a fantastic lockdown as much as the lockdown could be. We keep kept focused that the training that we could do improvised where we had to. We had a gym set up in the back garden. We had uh, no access to a track. So we found a, a bit of concrete. Um, tarmac that we could train on and my coach marked 100 meters out rather discreetly because he didn't want to get caught with uh, nearly doing graffiti on the road um, so we we tried to make the best of a bad situation and and we came out really strong and I raced a fantastic 800 in Bern being the first woman to go under two minutes in the 800 and um, first Irish woman and to set a lovely PB there and then to come out in Monaco Diamond League and to run a national record over the 1k and and yeah, sometimes as an athlete, you kind of look and you think, goodness, I didn't, I knew that I was capable of it, but I maybe didn't quite expect those two blistering performances. Um, so it was a fantastic start to, to what's been a kind of strange season. Are you one of those athletes who, who knows in herself that she's ready to run a big race? Do you, do you get a sense in the sort of in your preparation and in the build up and when you're there waiting for the uh, you know for the for the pistol to crack that this could really be a good one for you um strangely i'm not actually i i'm not quite um a huge buff on athletics and even my own athletics i i have teammates here in team new balance manchester who who stringently know what sessions they did three years ago and we'll remember them and we'll, ha we'll go back and review them and be like, I did this three years ago because athletics is a very repetitive sport. We kind of do the same thing day in, day out. There's only so many ways to skin a cat and, and you kind of find the, the template that works for you and you relatively repeat it. So myself and Steve found a fantastic template this year, which went really well. And, and we're probably going to repeat that with a few tweaks. Um, I didn't have a good performance on Sunday and that's fine. I'll learn from that. I find that even the negatives you can learn from and, and build on. Um, but I'm not one of those people that intrinsically knows myself because I don't actually remember my training. I just go out and run and, and that's how I like to be. My coach tells me, yeah, you're doing this and this time and I just go do it. He says, jump and I jump. And, um, and he, I kind of turned to him for that... Uh, that guidance that says you're actually in really good shape and I'm like oh am I and and my boyfriend is is quite knowledgeable on the sport and he can tell whenever I'm in good shape he's like you're looking fit and I'm like all right oh, good <laughs> and uh, and then and then it shows whenever I go out but it's not something I really leave to chance like Steve is definitely a person who's intrinsically planned um, and like very specifically planned my whole running and, and everything there. But we also work on that mental side as well to make sure that I'm in the best place possible mentally going into the race. So I suppose I put absolutely every little jigsaw piece in place. Um, and I don't always necessarily know that it's going to click perfectly, um, but it's, uh, it's beautiful when it does. <laughs> 
it certainly is, and it has been uh, thus far this season for the most part, anyway. Um, when you went over to Manchester, you joined Team New Balance, and that gave a real sort of boost almost to you know to a career that was that was already showing huge potential, but that was an important one. Are you back there now? Are you back in the in the groove with with the with with your teammates, or how has that whole sort of set of, of the way that you're living life away from the track actually been changed by everything that's happened? Yeah, I suppose I'm so lucky. Whenever I joined Team New Balance Manchester, there's not actually too many professional teams in the whole of Europe. It's something that's relatively common in America, but in Europe, it's not very common. And, and whenever I joined this team, um, I saw it as a huge opportunity and it gave me an awful lot of... Um, of a solid base really of where I was going to continue to build from. I, I already had all of the pieces, um, but you know, having a solid base and being able to build and have teammates around me who inspire me, who, who I inspire and we work together to really go from strength to strength. Steve has worked so hard to learn so much about me as an athlete um, because as well, no athlete is the same and you can't train them all the same. So I feel that I've really built a team around me that is, um, that's, that's something that I'm extremely grateful for and I feel very lucky to have. And, um, and yeah, I feel it's been a strange year for all of us. Um, all of our team are different places at different times. Um, there's a couple of us that are track athletes and we race on the track, so our season is all askew. And some people have races, some people don't. I have a lot of teammates who are marathon runners and, and their marathon plans have been completely dashed with marathons cancelled. And I really feel for them because I can, I can fit in a 1500 metre here or there. Um, a marathon prep isn't something you can rush or something that you can just be like, right, scrap that, we're going to go here. Because you've just ran a, a huge block. Um, but I think we all piece together so perfectly and we really raise each other up. I'm so excited to see my, my British teammates race the London Marathon. I have um, a couple of male teammates, Johnny Meller and Ross Millington, who are going to go out in the London Marathon and are going to really go and battle to make the British Olympic team. And, and I hope that I have my Team New Balance Manchester teammates in Tokyo. And that's something that's so exciting and something that I think as a group, we really bring each other on. And, uh, and I feel very fortunate to have it. So I feel like the little groove is well worn here. Um, this is a very comfortable place. And, and I come back to my team and, and, you know, they're some of my closest friends and they're nearly like a second family to me now. And, uh, and I think that that really has helped me as an athlete grow from strength to strength. It's great to have that in a sport which is very much individual, and very much you against your previous self in terms of the training, in terms of what you're doing. Um, but you grew up playing team sports. You grew up as a camogie player, is that right? Yes, I did. I grew up um, in, a, in a small town called Portaferry in County Down. And camogie was my first love. And, uh, and really where I cut my teeth in sport. And, and genuinely, I feel it's um, that foundation that made me the athlete I am today. Um, and I absolutely loved playing for my local club, Portaferry, and, and playing with my girls from my town, with my big sister, Myra. And, uh, and I had such a passion for camogie. I, I often laugh whenever I reflect on it. It was nearly an obsession and one that only a, a youngster can have. Um, like I'm certainly not as obsessed with my sport now as I was with with camogie whenever I was um, whenever I was a teenager and whenever I was younger. And um, like I, so much so that I wouldn't wear colours that were our counterparts colours. I wouldn't put black and amber on me any day. And even though I sometimes I don't just because of it's so ingrained in me and I I think that's something that's fantastic. I learned so much about myself through that sport. And, um, and yeah, I certainly missed that team aspect. And I feel like I missed it hugely throughout athletics until I found this team and I joined this team. And now I have a new team. And funnily enough, we also compete in blue and yellow. So maybe there's a little, uh, a little sign there. A sign of history repeating itself across the ages. And would you ever be tempted when Steve maybe looked to one side to go out and have a little puck around with some of your friends when you're home or anything like that? Oh, I certainly do. And Steve doesn't have to look away because he knows he doesn't have an option. I um, I love to get out and have a little puck about. And, and I have hurls here with me. Um, uh, a good friend from, from Irish Athletics, Timmy Crow. Um, I jokingly re replied to him once on an Instagram story about some hurls he had. Um, he's a strong Clare man and he, uh, a good hurling family. And um, and he's like, do you want some? And I went to the national champs and he hands me, I think, four hurls and, and brand new grips. And I was like, oh, t Timmy, like, tell me what you wouldn't take anything from me. So I have I have some fantastic hurls here over in Manchester. My teammates love getting out for a puck about too. And, um, and I've actually lent them to my uh, sports therapist kids because they play cricket. And I was like, do you want to try 
camogie and hurling. So they've absolutely loved it too. So I'm spreading the love for, for Gaelic games over here in Manchester. And, and I find um, getting out and having a puck about a great release for me. It's something that, that nearly grounds me and roots me back into, into where it all began. And I find it um, very hypnotic having a, having a puck about against the wall. In getting back to your roots, well, you're obviously a great ambassador for the sport of camogie. You're an ambassador as well for Lille. They are selling Jackie Hurley's book, Girls Play 2, at the moment. It's yeah. on an exclusive, exclusive period until September the 6th. It is fantastic. As a, as a dad, as a coach of girls' teams, I absolutely love it. What is it like to actually be in it, to have somebody drawing cartoons of you and then writing your life story in... 200 words or less as Jackie has done. How did you, how oh, do you find that? Do you know, whenever Jackie asked me, would I like to be included in her book? I was, uh, I was like, I don't even know why you're asking. Oh yes, hundred percent. Like I was, I was so taken aback. I was like, oh my goodness, because I find it a kind of, um, I, I, there's disbelief that people would see me as a role model. Um, I understand why, because of the sport, but like, even whenever I kind of get a grasp, I'm like, oh my goodness, like I'm a role model for people. It's, something so humbling so whenever Jackie asked me would I like to be in her book I was like oh Jess I jumped at the chance and uh, and yeah to be immortalized in cartoon form is something that uh you know it, I felt almost giddy getting my own copy we got posted a little copy Jackie sent us and uh whenever I opened it up I'm I'm the back page and uh being immortalized in in cartoon form and I think they did a great job looks just like me um it's That's something brilliant. That, you'll, you'll have to definitely get that frame to go alongside oh, the, the hurls on the uh, leaning up against the wall as well. And then um, the whole way off the family home. It's, it's a huge honour and to be able to be a role model for young girls and young boys, because I believe that we can be a role model for everybody. It's not just women, but for little girls to have other girls to look up to, um, because the boys have so many. But uh, to be there and to be a role model for young girls all over the the Ireland, island of Ireland. Um, and as well, like my, my own teammate, Anna, got straight onto this and sent it to somebody at home in Sweden and said, how can we do this in Sweden? So we're inspiring people around the world to, to get on that and to have their women as role models and to inspire their young girls. And um, it's such a huge honor. Brilliant. We'll have to see if Jackie has got a touch of Swedish in her locker <laughs> as well. Um, just before I let you go, there's just one thing that's always fascinated me about you you've always been very strong on your faith and that's not something that has been particularly uh, you know to the fore in Irish sport other than through Katie Taylor who again is right up there at the moment and you know being the best in the world setting records as she goes um, y your, your your faith is something that's clearly very personal to you but something that you're comfortable with sharing as well where, yeah. where did that where did that come from and, and how important is it to you as part of your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, I suppose like um, like many people maybe growing up in Ireland, like I, I, I suppose you never really understand what, you're, what everybody's typically um, brought up like, but whenever I share my, what, discussing how my life was growing up with some of my fellow female athletes on uh, at competitions um, and I talk about growing up and we went to mass before we went to school my granny always brought us down to mass I think it was on a Friday and a Tuesday or something like that um, and and how I played camogie and you know that's such a strong part of my parish um, and the parish is something that's kind of connected between the the, the Gaelic grounds the chapels right next to it my school was right next to it so I went to to St Mary's Primary School in Portaferry and then Assumption Grammar School in Ballina Hinch. Um, and I suppose faith has always been a part of my life. And um, I suppose you're born into the into your religion in a lot of ways. I, I was brought up Catholic and um, I went to mass. It was an important part of my family. Uh, my mummy and daddy would always encourage us to go to mass. Like sometimes we wouldn't be too pleased when we were younger, not gonna lie. Um, like many as a child, you're like, oh, I have to go to mass this weekend. and and. My siblings had the rebellious years where my mummy was trying to get them out and they were maybe hung over. And, uh, and I was often the well-behaved one that just did watch the status quo and I just went and, and I'd be like, right, get up, mummy's gonna be annoyed with you. Um, so I suppose that was the, the religious aspect of it. Um, I grew up in the Catholic church and went to schools with a very Catholic ethos. Um, and I always went to mass, even whenever I went to university, 
there was something that I, I find very calming about the lovely little chapel in UCD. And, and even if I just went there and sat, um, and I'd urge anybody who goes to the university or who is around it just to go and sit in it. It's a beautiful space and you don't have to be religious to go into it. It's, it's very calming and just to sit there. And, and then I suppose I started exploring then what faith was. And, uh, and like I kind of view my religion and faith slightly different. Um, for me, faith is something that's very personal to me and I know how to practice it through the religion of Catholicism. Um, and I, and I observed that growing up. My, my granny Kathleen and, and my grandparents actually on both sides, I had a little rosary ring that belonged to my granda McGeehan, my papa Jimmy. Um, they were all great believers in the rosary. And uh, I, I witnessed my, my granny go through a really hard time battling um, lung cancer. Unfortunately, it took her life. But I distinctly remember visiting her in the hospital and um, the curtains were drawn and I, I was just kind of, you know, you kind of listen as her a doctor in with her, well, I give her some space. She was, and she was praying. And um, so I hung back and I was like, I'll let her, I'll give her some space. And I was just kind of chilling outside and, and she was praying the rosary and she was praying that, um, that the sacred heart and that Mary would give her strength to get through her treatment. And, and something like I get quite emotional speaking about it. I'll probably get a little bit, uh, a little bit of a tight throat because um, I dearly miss my granny. Um, but I, I saw a lot of strength in that, that she turned to, to the rosary to try to give her strength. She didn't ask for it to take the cancer away. She didn't ask for it to take the pain away, just to give her strength. And, and I realized that we, we seek out so many ways to try to improve our mental health and to, to carry out meditation. And, um, and I started realizing that like the rosary is basically meditation um, in a structured form that I know how to do. So I started using it in such a way that it's like my little form of meditation. I have, I have rosary beads that are always in the bag I travel with and, and a little thing of holy water that was from my mum. Around my neck, I always have a miraculous medal that was a gift for my 21st birthday from my mummy. And it's something that's really close along with a couple of other things that mean a lot to me too. Um, and like my friends probably are like, oh, she's so religious. And I don't think I'm very religious. You know, you won't find me preaching and you won't, um, I, I don't say you have to go to mass and, and, and I'm very much um, separate to that. But, uh, but I think faith is something that's, um, that's very important. And I have a faith that I practice. Some other people, I, I often joke that I belong to the church of running as well. That's another separate form of faith. And, and so many people get strength from that. I see people across Ireland who, who run in, is um, it holds such a strong bond for them and, and it seems to really help them mentally. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, we find faith in so many different things. Um, so I find it, uh, I find it something interesting. People find it interesting hearing me speak about it. I'm a young girl um, and faith seems very foreign. And I have a boyfriend who, who is atheist and he, he scoffs at me quite often. And then I just discuss it. I'm like, well, it's like meditation. Why? I find it gives me something and it takes nothing. So, so it's good. Um, and funnily enough, I, I was invited to the Vatican uh, off that very topic. I think there was, a, there was an article um, where they wrote about my faith because they'd asked me about it. I think I, I jokingly said, well, these light some candles for me <laughs> um, before, uh, before a championship race. Um, and so that brought up the conversation. And, uh, and I think it's something that's interesting. I was like, oh, I'd love to visit the Vatican, get to meet Pope Francis. It'd be a good crack. Uh, so it was basically like a sports day. Um, so you know you know faith opens an awful lot of doors as well but um it's something that's very personal to me and i think i'd encourage people to explore um meditation and forms of trying to help their mental health and for me that's one of the areas you're brilliant you know if only we could bottle a little bit of kira mcgee in it would oh. make all of the troubles that we're going through at the moment <laughs> just that little bit easier to uh, to take but Listen, the very best of luck and in, in the rest of the athletics season you set a very high bar for yourself but no doubt you've got exactly the right fortitude to keep on raising that as well. So Tokyo 21 as the ultimate objective, at least for this round of, of campaigning. Um, you're a cartoon superstar, you're a Komogi ambassador, you're our athlete of the moment. And Kira McGeehan, it has been a real pleasure to talk to you on Sports Business today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rob.